Um, all right. Today we are talking about uh, renal anatomy, physiology, and um, testing for renal disease. It's going to be really hard not to get too deep into any of those topics without sort of delving into topics that we are going to cover in a bit more depth in individual sessions. So as an example, talking about glomerular anatomy is much more relevant when we're talking about glomerular diseases. So I don't want to get too kind of caught up on too many details anatomically today, um, particularly with the glomerulus. Um, and I love renal physiology and I've come across this video that explains it better than I'm going to be able to. So I'm going to be really lazy today and show you a video from YouTube. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, what I want to do first is just cover a bit of the anatomy and a couple of concepts that um, were light bulb moments for me. And then um, I'm going to put the video on it. It goes for 13 minutes. It's not a short one, but I like the, this, the way it divides up the tubular function is just excellent. Um, and uh, Josh can't come this morning, but he referred me to this guy who does medical videos and he's such a good resource. It's so good. Um, freely available on YouTube. Okay, so let's start with um, how is urine produced? Broadly. Oh. In the kidneys. <laughs> In the kidneys, yeah, exactly. So how, what is, um, what is urine? What's kind of water? Stuff taken out. <laughs> yeah. It's just water and waste products, basically. It's an ultra filtrate, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and, exactly. and electrolytes as well. Yeah, there's electrolytes in there for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, how? Let's talk about renal anatomy. What percentage of the blood that comes out of the heart goes to the kidneys? Does anyone know? About twenty-five. 25, it's a huge amount of blood, but there's still 75% of the blood that's not filtered with every pump of the heart. Um, so 25% of the blood goes to the kidneys during optimal hydration. And what is the vessel? Let's, uh, let's talk about broader renal anatomy. What is... Mm, What are the kidneys made up of? Tubes. Tubes. 500,000 nephrons. Nephrons. Yeah. Kidney. yeah. So many nephrons. Yeah, with a funnel at the end. With at a big funnel. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. So when we look at the gross anatomy of the kidney, we've got an artery coming in, a vein coming out, and a funnel coming out. So three tubes at the renal hilus. And then we've got the cortex, which is made up of what predominantly? Uh, glomeruli, isn't it? Yep, exactly. So all the glomeruli sit in the cortex. And then what comes off the glomerulus? Is it like the loop of Hindi? First? What's the, the first prox part? Proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal tubule, exactly. Mm -hmm. Most of the proximal tubule is still in the cortex. And then you remember the anatomy, the diagrams, dips down. That's the, the next bit. Loop of Henley, good. Dips down, goes back up again. And what's the next bit? Distal. Good. Convoluted tubule. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which has gone back up, typically in the cortex. Some of them are in the um, medulla, but most of them in the cortex. And then what's next? Collecting. Collecting ducts. Collecting it? duct, exactly. And that dives back down into the medulla. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it goes into the renal pelvis. And then it goes out into the ureter. Um, so we talked about the blood coming in to the glomerulus. What happens after it's been in the glomerulus? So the blood that's not gone through into the tubule. It'd go back out through the renal vein, wouldn't it? Eventually, yeah, but I want to know where it goes between the afferent arterial going into the glomerulus and then what happens. 
there are these accurate arteries in the cortex. Is it going there? Um, the arcuate arteries are pre-glomerulus, so they're bringing the blood to the glomeruli. But good, because we see them on ultrasound, actually, that that's the arcuate arteries have quite bright walls and sometimes they can be mistaken for um, nephrolids. So they are a significant part of the anatomy that's worth mentioning. They're often along this, alongside the sort of calyces, like you sort of see them quite bright walled there. That, that's the arteries that are bright walled. Yeah, the arcuate yeah. arteries. And the, the only real relevance is that they're, so it sort of goes renal artery and then um, the main arteries split off into arcuate arteries as they go up um, to feed into the glomeruli. Um, so we've got kind of arterial supply and then we get to the afferent arteriole, which is kind of, and then the glomerulus is the capillary bed. If we're looking at the kind of peripheral vasculature equivalent. And then what happens after a capillary bed? Uh, they then exit the glomerulus and I think they run down the tubules, don't they? Good, yes. So this is a really key part of renal anatomy that is absolutely crucial to understanding both glomerular disease, tubular disease and perpetuation of renal injuries with renal disease. So the afferent arteriole goes into the glomerulus. The blood kind of sits around in this glomerular capillary bed and then the leftover blood goes out of the efferent arteriole. That arteriole forms the vasa recta, which wraps around the tubule. So when we're talking about the functions of the kidney, what are the functions of the kidney? This is a hard question. I've kind of got this category in my head, but it's maybe not common, the, the common way of thinking about it. But what do, what do the kidneys, what are the kidneys functions? Produce urine to excrete to toxins. Good. Yeah. Produce bicarbonate, produce EPO. Produ produce or? They, oh yeah, they retain bicarbonate. Do they? It depends on the balance. So oh, it depends right. on what's needed. So I would divide that into the two functions, reabsorption and secretion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're two of the functions. And excretion was, was one that was mentioned as well. And then the first one is that in my head is filtration. So first step, filtration, reabsorption and secretion. So maintaining acid-base balance, maintaining um, uh, hydration. And blood pressure too. And blood pressure. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. And then excretion of white waste products. So those are the sort of four functions that I sort of have in my head. Um, why are we talking about those functions? Oh, the vasa recta. So the vessel goes around the tubule. And we're, when we're talking about both reabsorption and secretion in particular, reabsorption, you need to have three spaces. You need to have the inside of the tubule contains the ultrafiltrate or the filtrate. Then you need to have the cell, the intracellular space, and then you need to have the blood vessel next to it to facilitate that movement between circulation and tubule. So the filtrate that comes through is so heavily modified, and if any of those compartments are not functional, so if the tubule's blocked and there's no urine flowing through it, obviously we're not going to get reabsorption or secretion. If the cells are swollen and they're not functioning, so the NAKATPA pumps aren't functioning for whatever reason, shock, sepsis, whatever, um, then we're going to get cell swelling and we're not going to get normal trans transport of um, those solutes. And if the blood vessel gets a clot in it or if we've got decreased glomerular flow, for example, hypoperfusion, then we're not going to get absorption or secretion working properly. Make sense? Yep, it's a really key concept, and particularly because one of the things that happens with renal disease is they lose protein, they become hypercoagulable, and they get clots in the glomeruli, in the arterioles. And all of a sudden, that whole nephron's wiped out because there's no blood supply, so because you've lost one of your compartments that you need for reabsorption and secretion. So why are they called vasa recta when they wrap around the tubules? Vasa recta means uh, straight vessels. I have no idea. What do you mean? How does it mean straight vessel? 
Well, What's I think the, re re the rector means, I think it means straight, doesn't it? I don't know. Uh, it's Latin. Is it Latin? Yeah. Right, yeah. we've got Google. <laughs> yeah, Google will know. Carry yeah, on. Google will tell us. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll find out. Um, what does Father Rector mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so then once that um, blood vessel is wrapped around that tubule, whole length of the tubule, then it goes out into the renal vein. The leftover blood goes out into the renal vein and everything that's been reabsorbed goes back into circulation. Um, all right. Now, I might play this video. Hopefully. Is somebody Googling that? Or is that better? <laughs> no? No. <Nah. laughs> um, all right. Hopefully this works. Can you see that? Yeah. Great. Um, so it's quite long and it's quite heavy. Be prepared to take some notes. And this is a video that I watched twice yesterday and it um, still... I still want to take notes when I look the at it. The kidneys are very, very important <laughs> organs. Um, the functional units of the kidneys are the nephrons, and we have millions of these in each kidney. The nephron, the kidneys, are important in forming urine, and there are four main steps in urine formation. These are filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. In this video, we will focus mainly on reabsorption and secretion. It's important to understand some terminology, though. Reabsorption refers to the movement of water and solutes from the nephron back into circulation. Secretion is the movement of solutes and stuff from circulation back into the nephron, back inside the nephron tubule. So let's just recap some anatomy first. Here you have the nephron. The afferent arterial brings in blood brings in plasma to the head of the nephron, where the vessels here will form what's called the glomerulus. The vessels will then exit the head of the nephron via the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial will then form the vasorecta, which are basically capillaries which will follow the tube of the nephron. The vasorecta allow for reabsorption of things back into circulation, while at the same time allow for secretion of things from the circulation back inside the nephron tubule. Now the tubule of the nephron has a few sections. <laughs> After the head of the nephron, called the Bowman's capsule, you have the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubules, and then the collecting duct. These different segments or sections of the nephron are responsible for the reabsorption of different electrolytes and substances, as well as water, but also these different segments of the nephron may absorb the same things, but in varying amounts. So let's focus on the reabsorption of things first, beginning with the proximal convoluted tubules. Here, you get reabsorption of sodium, chloride, potassium, glucose, amino acids, which are the protein uh, building units, urea, and bicarbonate, as well as water, of course. In the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water reabsorption takes place. In the, I'm just going to pause that. Now we've talked to they've talked about the proximal convoluted tubule, and I just want to apply some kind of um, I guess disease relevance to what happens in the proximal tubule. Um, so, can anybody tell me what Fanconi syndrome is? Uh. You know what happens in beagles, but uh, in terms of, I don't, uh, I know, uh, I don't know if it happens in beagles. Is it percentages? Oh, percentages, yes. Percentages, oh, it is. Yes. Percentages yes. for beagles. Yeah. Ah, yeah. sorry. No, that's yeah. right. It's the B one. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. might be beagles as well. <laughs> no, percentages are classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Percentages. Um, yeah, they have they have glucosuria mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, and normoglycemia. Um, uh, they also, I think they lose bicarbonate as well and they become Good. acidotic. Yep. So the treatment involves probably 
sometimes fairly massive, massive amounts of bicarbonate in the diet, at least. Mm. Um, so the other thing they use is loses amino acids. Um, so the reason I wanted to mention this is this is very localized disease to the proximal convoluted tubule. So if you're seeing glucosuria with a normoglycemia, you've localized disease to the proximal convoluted tubule because this is the spot where glucose needs, it should have been reabsorbed and wasn't. So in what other situation, so we see genetic Fanconi disease in Basenges, what other situation do we see glucosuria with normoglycemia? Like just physiologically stress. We shouldn't oh. actually. Not yeah. what's the hyperglycemia resulting in glucosuria with stress, but we shouldn't see glucosuria with stress without a high blood glucose as well. What's the renal threshold? What's the tubules threshold for glucose reabsorption? About 13 millimoles per litre. But depending on the, um, on the author, it can vary a bit. The author and the species, actually. So 12 yeah. dogs, 12 to 15 for cats, depending on, again, author and reference. Um, so if your blood glucose is less than 12 to 15, the tubule should be able to absorb all of it. Um, have you guys heard of the treat toxicities with the and melamine um, contamination in dog food and stuff? Yeah. And yeah. That, that was in baby foods from China, wasn't it? There was baby food, but actually in dog foods. So we see glucosuria in the absence of hyperglycemia in dogs when they've got had these contaminated treats and they've had a proximal tubular toxicity. And that's just really tells you that even if they're not azotemic, that that tubule has been injured. And once you know that that tubule has been injured and you also know that the amino acids aren't being reabsorbed there, what happens when there's protein in the tubule? Oh, it have an osmotic effect. Definitely have an osmotic sucking, effect. Good. Sucking water into the, um, yep. into the tubule. Yep. What's a hyaline cast? Mm. I guess it's clogged up proteins. Yep, exactly. And what would that do in a tubule? It'll block it. <laughs> yeah, it'll block it. Exactly. So we see tubular obstruction associated with proteinuria, and that's one of the mechanisms of exacerbation of renal injury when they've got proteinuria. Mm. Um, so that sort of disease relevance for that sort of look, just really getting your head around what the proximal tubules function is. And then I want you to sort of picture the proximal tubules in the cortex and then this loop of Henle dipping down into the hypertonic medulla. So remember the medulla's got the in urea and sodium in the interstitium. So it sucks all the water out. So this loop of Henle, you just said that um, water is absorbed in this descending loop of Henle. And I'm going to push play again. Ascending limb of the loop of Henle, so they're going up high. Sodium, chloride, and potassium reabsorption occurs. The loop of Henle here has a descending uh, limb and it is ascending limb, as we talked about. The distal convoluted tubules are responsible for the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. The collecting duct here is responsible for the reabsorption of sodium, chloride, urea, and water. Now, different segments of the nephrons also allow for the secretion of things back inside the tubule from the circulation, specifically from the basa recta. Now, the proximal convoluted tubule allows for the secretion of creatinine, certain drugs, as well as hydrogen ions, which are, if you remember, these guys are the acidic ones. And the distal convoluted tubule allow for the secretion of hydrogen ions as well, as well as potassium. When I finished year 12, I got an <laughs> HR of 99.25. So if you've got a student in year 7, 8, 9... Sorry. In the distal convoluted tubule, there's actually an important transporter, which is actually responsible for the exchange of sodium and potassium. And this is how the potassium enters the tubule of the nephron. And this transporter is also a site where diuretics have an effect. Important things to take note here is that sodium and water 
play a key role in regulating our blood pressure. Bicarbonate and hydrogen ions play a key role in acid-base balance, so maintaining the pH of our body. So let us now focus on each segment or each section of the nephron and look into it in a bit more detail, firstly focusing on the re reabsorption of things that occur in this area. So let's look at what happens in the proximal convoluted tubule and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The lumen here refers to the tubule of the nephron, so inside the nephron tube. And the cells here refer to the cells which line up the tube of the nephron. And here is the vasa recta, which is the circulation. In the proximal convoluted tubule, sodium get reabsorbed together with glucose or amino acids. The glucose or amino acid will then get reabsorbed back into circulation. There is another transporter which uses an exchanger, a sodium for hydrogen exchange. The sodium is reabsorbed inside the cells and then is exchanged with potassium via the sodium potassium ATPase pump. The sodium potassium ATPase pump is very important to remember and it is situated usually on the basal aspect of the cell, so closer towards circulation. The proximal convoluted tubule is important in regulating acid-base balance. It is a site where hydrogen can be secreted, as you can see here, but also it's a site where bicarbonate can be reabsorbed. What happens is a chemical reaction takes place. Hydrogen ions inside the lumen of the nephron react with bicarbonate ions to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. Through the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, or CA, carbonic acid gets converted to water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Carbon dioxide is a gas which can diffuse back into the cell. Water is also present inside the cell. And so carbon dioxide can diffuse back into circulation because it's a gas. Further, within the cell, the same reaction can take place with the same enzyme carbonic anhydrase which makes carbonic acid again. Carbonic acid can then become hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, and the cycle can continue. And that is why when you have an increase in carbon dioxide levels, you are more acidic because there's a shift for more hydrogen ion production. That was pretty heavy. Is everyone following? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. It was pretty quick, wasn't it? It's very quick, yeah. So this is, we've sort of done the acid base talk when we were doing emergency stuff and looking at blood gases and stuff. Um, the main thing here is that this is just a cycle to circulate hydrogen ions, essentially. Um, the only thing that kind of moves in and out of this equation, this sort of cycle, is the CO2. So... Um, if you've got a metabolic acidosis, or oh, wait a minute, sorry, if you've got excess CO2, so what situations would you have excess CO2? Uh, respiratory compromise. Excellent. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So under anesthetic, for example, tick paralysis, we're going to have more CO2 in blood. It's going to diffuse across down its concentration gradient into the intracellular space of the um, epithelial cell lining the tubule and then we're going to get a shift towards more hydrogen ions and that's going to facilitate excretion of those hydrogen ions into the urine make sense mm. Mm. okay can we keep going yes yes okay and more acidity the hydrogen here can also come from circulation the bicarbonate can be reabsorbed into circulation to increase the pH of blood to make it more alkali if it has to. And it does this with a symptom, a type of transport which brings back into circulation bicarbonate and sodium. And so bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule is sodium dependent. It's important to note that other electrolytes are also reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, which I have not actually drawn. And these include calcium ions, for example, and majority of calcium is reabsorbed here. 
the ascending loop of Henle, not the descending loop of Henle, is a site where electrolytes are also reabsorbed. There is a trisymptoma, a transporter which brings in one potassium, two chloride, and one sodium back inside the cell. The potassium and chloride then go through another symptoma, which carries it back into circulation, while the sodium gets exchanged for potassium through, again, the sodium-potassium ATPase. And so you can see this sort of repetition with the sodium-potassium ATPase on the basal surface of the cell. Important to note here on the apical surface, on the top of the cells of the loop of Henle, there are passive channels which allow sodium to enter the cell from the lumen and also potassium to enter the lumen from the cell. Let us now focus on what happens in more detail at the distal convoluted tubule, as well as the collecting duct. I wrote here distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct because these parts of the nephrons share some similar functions as well. Again, you have the lumen of the nephron tubule and the cells which line up the tubule. And here is the vasorecta, which is the circulation essentially. In the distal convoluted tubule, sodium and chloride get reabsorbed via a symptoma. The chloride has its own channel from here back into circulation. While sodium actually obviously gets exchanged for a potassium via, again, the sodium potassium ATPase on the basal surface of the cell. The potassium can passively go through into the lumen of the nephron from the cell. Magnesium and calcium reabsorption is thought to occur via paracellular routes, meaning in between the cells, in between the tight junctions, and is thought to occur via diffusion. Now, towards the collecting duct, there are important processes which take place. And it is here in particular where the last bit of reabsorption and secretion takes place before the final urine product is produced. From the lumen of the nephron, sodium is reabsorbed in exchange for hydrogen ions. And the reabsorption of sodium into circulation from inside the cell relies upon hydrogen exchange. So now you have sodium in circulation and you have hydrogen in the lumen. Whenever you have hydrogen in the lumen, you know acid-base balance stuff occurs depending on the pH of the blood. The acid-base regulation allows hydrogens to interact with bicarbonate ions to become carbonic acid, then again, to carbon dioxide and water. The carbon dioxide can diffuse easily inside the cell in and out because it's a gas. Within the cell, however, carbon dioxide can react with water again, and the reverse reaction can take place. Water and carbon dioxide become carbonic acid, and then again to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Bicarbonate reabsorption into circulation uses an exchanger, a bicarbonate chloride exchanger. And so the big difference um, to the reabsorption of bicarbonate here is that it relies on chloride rather than sodium. And so it is not sodium dependent like the proximal convoluted tubule. Finally, within the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, there are many channels which basically exchange sodium and potassium and not necessarily ATP dependent, rather, it is controlled by an important hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone produced and secreted by the adrenal glands, specifically the adrenal cortex, in response to low blood pressure. An increase in circulating aldosterone means more sodium will be reabsorbed, which means more water will be reabsorbed to increase blood pressure. However, this means more potassium will also be secreted, there is a decrease in potassium reabsorption, which will cause hypokalemia, low potassium in the blood. Finally, let us focus on what happens only in the collecting ducts. The apical surface of the cells here lining the collecting ducts have these special channels called aquaporins, which allow for reabsorption of water. This is the final concentrating area for urine which occurs in the collecting duct. When the body reabsorbs water, it will increase the osmolality of urine. So it will increase the solute concentration in urine. The number of aquaporins in the collecting duct is controlled also by a hormone. And this hormone is called 
antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. This hormone targets the collecting ducts and essentially tells the cells here to make more aquaporins, which, which means with more aquaporins, it means more water will be retained in circulation. After all the reabsorption and secretion that takes place uh, along the tubule of the nephron, urine is produced. So what is in urine then? Well, it's mainly water, but it also contains nitrogenous waste, which is toxic if it stays in the body. It also contains lots of metabolites and also can contain red blood cells and white blood cells, usually in extremely low numbers. However, red blood cells and white blood cell numbers in urine can obviously be high, but this is, of course, when there, are, when there is an infection or some form of pathology that is occurring along the urinary tract. everyone got it? Oh. Yeah, it's quite Ooh. simple, isn't it? Yeah. It's quite simple. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful description of it. Uh, isn't I, it? I don't think I've ever seen, so, any, seen it so simply explained before. Me neither, but it is definitely a pause, comprehend, start again. Mm. I think it's, it would be a really good video to do when you were doing like proximal tubular acidosis versus distal tubular um, acidosis and stuff just with the difference in the bicarb absorption and stuff. Yeah. Does I, that I bicarb um, thing only happen in the kidneys where you have the carbonic carbon and hydrase? Yeah. Um, carbonic and hydrase is present in the eyes and in the brain as well. Um, and it works in the same way there just because yes. all, the, all the bits are there. Yeah. Uh, yes. I think so, except that none of the, the eyes and the brain are just moving it between vascular and cell yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. they're not excreting. Yeah. The kidney is the only place in the, well, kidney and colon are the only place in the body that you can acid base balance by actually getting rid of acid or bicarb in a controlled way. Right. I didn't realize about the colon. Colon's, um, uh, I don't know if there's carbonic and hydrase in there, but a big site of loss of bicarb. It's yeah. not as it's not as controlled as in the kidneys, um, but dogs with diarrhea will often mm. lose bicarb and become acidemic as a result right. of the um, okay. bicarb loss. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to cover in this session is diagnosis of renal disease. Um, and I don't want to go into too much sort of, we're not going to talk about renal biopsies or anything like that because um, it's more about sort of physiology side and how the physiology we've talked about um, helps us to make a diagnosis of what's going on. So how do we detect um, renal injuries? Well, increases in blood urea and creatinine, Good. Uh, two of them, and yep. the... Oh, the name's not coming to me. The new one that Bidex um, have got, um, which picks supposedly picks it up earlier. Yeah. I can't think of the name of it. SDMA? Yeah. Symmetrical dimethyl arginine, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's not often you have to say the full name. Um, so let's talk about those individually. Um, and let's actually park those. What do the patients usually come in for? PUPD or vomiting. Good, excellent. So what causes polyuria? Inability to reabsorb water. Excellent. Um, and what causes vomiting? The excessive metabolites in the patient. Yep. Urea being hitting the stomach acid and being converted to ammonia in the stomach and upsetting it. I don't know about that, actually. Or chemo receptor triggers in. I'd, I'd read uh, that somewhere. Because um, the, the impacts on the stomach are varied. So there's a couple of different theories why we see vomiting, uh, why we see gastric changes um, in cats in particular with chronic kidney disease. One is that gastrin is renally secreted. 
So gastrin is the hormone. If you, I, I'm sure you all remember off a heart, but it's the one that um, <laughs> uh, causes acid production in the stomach. Um, so it's the one that's um, like a meprazole blocks the effect mm. of gastrin. So if you can't excrete gastrin, then you get more acid production and you actually get hyperacidity in the stomach. So um, the, then the effect of that is that you get gastric wall thickening, you get hypertrophy. Um, so that's one reason why we might get nausea. But Abron is right in that the retention of nitrogenous wastes um, can trigger chemoreceptor, um, uh, not damage, but trigger the chemoreceptors in the brain and in the vomiting centre and cause nausea directly. Um, other acid-base imbalances can cause um, nausea and um, dysfunction of brain dysfunction, seizures and things as well. But that's pretty rare to see. Uh, it wasn't mentioned earlier with PUPD. There's two possible causes. One is <clears throat> renal driven, like losing water and then having to replace it. The other one is psychogenic or dipsia type yeah. of thing, where the excessive in intake has yeah. to be excreted. Yep. So uh, renal driven or thirst driven, I suppose. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. So normally, the degree of nitrogenous waste retention that would cause brain dysfunction, they're normally too nauseous to get a psychogenic polydipsia. So predominantly, mm. it's a lack of reabsorption oh, capacity yeah. because of reduced nephron, yeah. reduced functional yeah. nephron mass. Yeah. I mean, the in intake driven is quite uncommon, really. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a component. But, yeah, you do get those animals that are just living at the water bowl and can't, just can't get enough. Um, okay, so our patients come in with PUPD and a little bit of vomiting and we've done our blood test and we've seen um, a creatinine of 240 and a urea of 49. Uh, it is a five-year-old malnutrited crossbreed dog. Um, 240 and... 49. I'm just writing this down so I don't get lost. So this dog's come in for vomiting. It's come in, it's been detected with an azotemia. How are we going to classify that azotemia? Well, you need to know the urine specific gravity. You absolutely do. This is a vomiting dog. This could easily be decreased renal perfusion. Um, so the USG is 1052. Does this dog have renal disease? No. It's likely not. No. Are its, are its kidneys at risk? Yes. Can yeah. be at risk. Absolutely. It. So with that degree of azotemia, those kidneys are dangerously underperfused. Um, now this brings me to what I want to talk about most is the creatinine at 240. That's a, it's a moderate azotemia. The urea at 49, if you had a dog with chronic kidney disease, would you expect to see a urea at 49? No, probably no. not. No. Why? What would you expect? It would be lower. Yeah. And I don't know why. Uh, well, they'd, they'd be compensating. They would have compensated due to the chronicity of it. Also, it just doesn't go up as much with... Um, renal disease as opposed to pre-renal disease. But I don't know why, other than gastric bleeding. I don't know why, other than that. Good. Um, so what, what, um, where does urea come from? A protein breakdown in the liver. Good, excellent. So that protein breakdown might be normal physiologic protein catabolism within the body. Could be from a high protein meal. Could be from gastrointestinal hemorrhage, which Bron mentioned. So a digestion of blood is a high protein meal, essentially. Um, so urea varies a lot according to what's going on physiologically. We've got an anorexic dog who's been vomiting. They're in a catabolic state. Just normal protein catabolism is going to be increased in that situation. Perfusion is going to be increased, so we're going to get more muscle breakdown than usual. Did I say perfusion increase? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Um, so we're going to have an increased urea just based on the dehydration status of this dog. But then the big difference between the way that the kidneys manage urea and creatinine is that when tubular flow rate slows down, the kidneys resorb urea. Whereas when, so if you've got normal renal function, if you've still got 500,000 functional nephrons in a kidney and the kidney's just getting less blood, the rate of flow through each tubule is going to slow right down. You're going to absorb more, more of that urea. Whereas if you've got reduced renal function causing your um, azotemia, you've got less nephrons and more fluid flowing through because you've got less resorptive capacity. So the tubular flow rate is going to be increased. So you're going to lose your urea. So yeah. whilst there's heaps of overlap between dehydrated animals or pre-renal urea elevations and renal urea elevations, so you can never say, oh, it's definitely pre-renal because most renal patients have a pre-renal component as well. The like ratio of urea to creatinine elevation is very relevant to me when I'm particularly young dogs and um, looking at why they've presented. So in, uh, in acute on chronic onset of uh, renal disease, mm -hmm. sometimes urea can also be extremely high and that's more, are we saying it's more because it's pre-renal actually and not that's so much? That's the pre-renal component. So I often look at these acute on chronic presentations and I will loosely prognosticate based on the urea at what difference I can make with fluids. So if I've got a patient coming in with a creatinine of 600 and a urea of 11, I'm like, it's not good. Very, there's very little pre-renal component here. This patient's well hydrated. Um, it just is that dysfunctional. But if I've got a urea of 60, mm. I think we're going to make a bit of a difference with the with rehydration. Yeah. Never thought of it like that, but yeah, that's good. Mm, yeah. It's um, it makes me a bit nervous because obviously I'm we have to be conserv conservative with acute kidney injuries because the outcomes aren't very good, mm. um, and it's a long time in hospital and stuff to make a difference to these guys. It's a big commitment for everybody, dogs and cats and um, humans. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I do sort of tend to be a little bit more. Let's give it a go if the mm. urea is really high, but mm. not necessarily better prognosis, but a better chance of reversal yes yeah a better chance of improvement so we might not we might not be able to get the creatinine to normal but we might get it to 240 and if it stays there for another two years then that's a good outcome mm. over a week in hospital yeah cool um where does creatinine come from muscles uh, muscle. uh, good yeah, yeah excellent <laughs> so what what would what would cause what artifactually would impact the creatinine level? Cachexia. Oh, Excellent. Good. Um, and what about a greyhound, like a really fit animal with heaps of muscle? Yeah, that will be artificially elevated. Yeah, exactly. Um, so with creatinine, using that as the prognostic, um, the main prognostic factor, the creatinine is the best measure we have of GFR. We do have to take into account body condition of the animal and in particular muscle condition of the animal because, you know, you get skinny fat animals where you can feel their spine but they're porky. Um, uh, muscle condition is really important. Mm. Um, has anybody looked at the IRIS guidelines since the SDMA became a test? Yeah, can't remember them, but yes. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't remember them off the top of my head. Waste of time, don't do it. And if you're in, ever in an exam, I'd say I'd consult the IRIS guidelines for treatment according to um, creatinine level and stage of disease and presence of proteinuria and hypertension and stuff. Um, so they've changed their guidelines now that SDMA is in there. And what they used to say is if the creatinine is over 140, then you should start renal food. Now they say even if the creatinine is slightly under 140, but the SDMA is over 16, start renal food. So they've changed their guidelines a little bit based on the, 
if that's a if that is if the patient has a low body condition so they give you that guideline i've said that kind of backwards sorry for a low body condition patient if creatinine is low but sdma is over that cutoff then treat it as a stage two essentially right yeah so it, should, it shouldn't be based just on the number. It should also, you should take into account the body condition, but yes. not just be the number. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we can, we can only make guidelines based on numbers because other, the yeah. rest is just kind of too yeah. vague. Um, but yes, you should absolutely take into account a muscle condition score at each visit. Make sure that if they're losing muscle, but their creatinine is staying stable, that's a, a real time in, decrease in renal mm-hmm. muscle increase in creatinine. Yeah. The creatinine production is relatively constant, isn't it? Based, yeah. uh, based on muscle mass, I suppose. It should be. So if mm-hmm. you measure your healthy patients really regularly, day on day, their creatinine should be really stable. So it's hard, a little bit hard because often we're doing pre-anesthetic bloods on patients mm-hmm. and we sort of look and just say, okay, this is the baseline creatinine, but often these patients are fasted and had water withdrawn so in that situation the creatinine is not quite as stable but in normal hydrated patients it should be really stable like within 10 percent so if you see a jump in creatinine at any stage like if you see creatinine doubling in a patient they've had a renal injury if you're just doing your sort of pre-ga profile and you and you feel like they're well hydrated and their pcv is stable and and urea is stable and stuff as well they've had definitely had a renal injury um what about, oh sorry go ahead but with that injury like it should be a 20 percent increase is it right like to actually call it significant um from baseline yes like whatever the in, whatever in the big yeah baseline whatever it was yeah it should be like a 20 percent increase that you take into account if you're doing daily. Probably. yeah if if we sort of say 10 percent within like variation within 10% is normal for that patient, then probably 20% is a safe kind of, okay, this is a significant increase. Yep. But if they're normally 80, 20% increases 100, you know, you wouldn't look at that and go, oh, there's a big renal injury, but actually even if the creatinine is still normal, yep. that happening. It has been, yeah. 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 Um, what about SDMA? Where does that come from? It's a protein breakdown. Protein? Mm-hmm. Amino acid breakdown. I mean, isn't it an amino acid that's frozen? made when the proteins broken down i thought it was such a good question it is an amino acid byproduct but i think it's actually a nuclear metabolite just from normal cellular metabolism so as long as the number of cells in a body stays consistent the sdma should stay consistent Mm -hmm. um so it's a little bit raw it's it's sourced from a much wider variety of cells than creatinine and urea are which means it's less impacted by body condition. So given our our ways of measuring, so on our blood test, how much of the kidneys is damaged by the time we're getting a creatinine elevation? 75. 75%. What about SDMA? They say 25. (laughs) Yeah, 25 to 40. Yeah. (laughs) Um, the other thing that annoys me is we quite often get patients referred or get sent sort of like can you have a look at these bloods um and the sdma will be up but the creatinine is normal i'm like "Mm." (laughs) oh no sorry other way around the creatinine will be up but the sdma is normal i'm like this doesn't make sense (laughs) um so i think sdma needs a little bit of work but it's i if we're sort of idealistic about it it should be a much earlier, much better predictor of renal injury than creatinine is. So it's very useful to look at in context with the other blood tests. Understanding is it's a bit more variable than mm. day-to-day. Um, so and, and it's less mm. useful if there is no sarcopenia and than creatinine. Much more variable because it is so much more sen- sensitive to renal perfusion. So if you've got slight dehydration, mm. which is hydration status jumps around a little bit in normal patients. Mm. Like my dogs only drink twice a day, so they're getting pretty dehydrated part before they're next drink. Um, I've got whippets. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yes, it will be a little bit more variable, but it, that's a sign that it's more sensitive. Right. 
as a test. So yeah. a really sort of sensitive test is going to be a little bit more jumpy and you're going to get more false positives than right. a negative test. Um, what about in our urine? Jeff's mentioned we've got to look at the USG. I think everybody's familiar with why we need to look at the USG. Um, what else are we looking for in our urine? Our cells. Cells, good. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Why? Uh, because of uh, if there's kidney damage, they, 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 uh, well, they could bleed. If mm -hmm. they're damaged, what yep. it's giving red cells, or mm -hmm. uh, if there's an inflammatory cause such as mm -hmm. a bacterial infection, yep. the white cell count would be up. Yep. Excellent. And uh, what else will we look at? Look UPC. For? UPC? Yeah. UPC? Yep. Where, in what situation would you do a UPCR? It, it has to be when this, there's no active sediment, though. Like, Excellent. It be active sediment to do a UPC. Yep. Um, and would you only do a UPCR if you got a positive on your dipstick? No, ideally you should do it. I, 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 initially, I used to think yes, but now I've changed that and I think you should do it. Good. How good is studying for changing your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it's a, it, uh, my understanding, it's one of the markers of glomerular disease. So you may, so, I mean, that's why you're looking at it. And also it's in the guidelines. <laughs> yeah, it's in the guidelines. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Iris told me to. Um, <laughs> I, um, you can have, if you have like a significant proteinuria, uh, sorry, if you have no proteinuria on a dipstick, mm -hmm. is your UPCR always going to be low or could it still be quite high? I mean, low elevated, but, um, you know, a small increase above normal? Um it's really unlikely to be a really significant proteinuria if you've got a negative on your dipstick. The thing that is so variable is that if urine's really dilute, yeah, you could yeah. have quite significant protein loss, but just yeah. really dysfunctional kidneys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's barely going to show up on your dipstick, and you might think, oh, it's only mild, but actually it'll come back at four. Or something. Just yeah. Do that. yeah, okay, yeah. So also, it's for staging of kidney disease, right? Because you have the substaging with UPC and hyper uh, and uh, blood pressure. Exactly. Yeah. So pr proteinuria perpetuates renal disease quite significantly and warrants treatment and monitoring in and of itself. So if you've got a proteinuric animal, you you shouldn't just be doing azotemia checks. You should be doing UPCR checks as well. Um, and treating to minimise the protein loss because that will exacerbate the renal disease and shorten life expectancy and quality of life. Um, so we get false negatives on dipsticks with dilute urine, but also acidic urine. All and right. We know all about bicarb reabsorption in the proximal and distal tubules now. So we know that bicarb excretion mm -hmm. might be dysfunctional in these patients and we might end up with acidic urine. Mm -hmm. You can actually get false positives with alkaline urine. Oh. So the dipstick's a little bit flawed in patients with renal disease because we've got dysfunctional acid base stuff going so on. So you can get a false negative with acidic or false positive with alkaline. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, and as um, you mentioned, with active urine sediment, it's not a false positive. It's a there's protein in the urine because there's inflammation and we've got ooze of plasma proteins and usually red cells and white cells into the urine. But you will get a positive protein if there's active um, sediment or in, active inflammation in, in the kidneys or lower urinary tract. So you shouldn't use an infected urinary tract as a baseline UPCR. You should always treat an infection, then get your UPCR and use that one as a baseline. That's an indication for treating asymptomatic urinary, urinary tract infection in a, in a patient. That you want uh, to yes, treat. that's an interesting, <laughs> yes. Yeah, because you're not supposed to. Um, no, renal disease is one of the... For their predisposed to ascending infections and pyelonephritis. So you can treat it. And treat it, yeah. Asymptomatic. Yeah. Right. They're, they're a little bit vague 
on mm. what um what constitutes the guidelines for treatment but um, mm. we're going to talk yeah. about the um infection i'll go yeah. through yeah i'm so annoyed at the consent <laughs> statements not being consensual across the antimicrobial mm. stewardship and pyelonephritis <laughs> treatment yeah. um uh anything else we've sort of talked about urine testing any other testing you wanted to cover in the last couple of minutes blood pressure <clears throat> blood pressure yeah so blood pressure is a really important part of the staging and prognosticating for renal disease and minimizing progression of renal disease why now that we know that efferent afferent arteriolar anatomy because as the renal disease will progress it there will be hypertension because of the constriction so you need to treat that to release and you're more likely to get probably endothelial damage with hypertension and then yep. reduce renal function and more mm -hmm. nephrosis. yes more inflammation absolutely yeah so do you remember the glomerulus kind of has its own control over uh, its blood pressure it's got autonomous management so the glomerulus is a really low pressure capillary bed it just wants the blood to sit there and ooze through the the sieve essentially into the nephron um, or into the tubule so usually the afferent arteriole constricts to decrease blood flow when it feels like it's getting too much so we talk when we talk about systemic hypertension that's what we're measuring in renal disease but what's actually causes perpetuation of the kidney damage is glomerular hypertension. So loss of that autonomous control of blood pressure. Do you know at what systemic blood pressure it overwhelms the glomerulus's capacity to decrease blood flow into it? Would it be like 160 or something? Yeah, it's 160. Exactly. So as soon as you hit that cutoff, you start to get glomerular damage occur. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about that more when we talk about glomerular disease mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the anatomy and how that impacts and perpetuates, um, renal injuries. So that's the next lecture, is it? That's such a good question, Jeff. Let me check. Yes. Acute kidney injury next, then chronic kidney disease, then glomerular diseases. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just keep going. <laughs> and I don't have any more days off planned. So I really apologize for the last fortnight. We should have sent out an email saying it's not on. I just um yeah, okay. just was on holiday mode. Sorry. Terrible. Yeah. Oh, I for me, I was on holidays and I didn't have very good reception. So <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I went into the practice where I was working early so I could sit in a room quietly and listen to it before I started at nine o'clock and uh, nothing happened. There was, there was myself and one other anxiously awaiting your appearance. And of course I thought you, you told us. I thought you told us that you weren't going to be there. I might have, but I got yeah. Jeff's email and I was like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, there were two, two of us fouled it up. <laughs> yeah. Two Do you know what? Listening. Sam, I work with Sam. Sam told me she came. I work with Sam every Monday. I'm like, how did you not know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, no, we should have sent out an email. Lesson learned. Next time. Hmm. All right. Yes. Thank so you. Next, next, yeah. time, next time, Anna, I'll be in a practice in Canberra and I was probably they'll join in as well. Oh, excellent. Okay. Where in Canberra are you going? <laughs>